Hi, this is Zach. In this video lecture, we'll be getting into the nitty-gritty of linear regression. But this is more the theoretical lecture. We'll be getting into the code in the next lecture. So if your data is perfectly in the line, the best fit line is obvious. But if your data doesn't quite fit um, within a single line, then it's not quite clear what to to choose as the best fit line. Hmm, so how do we decide which line is the best fit line? I'm going to take a step into perhaps dangerous territory. So uh, I know many of you feel passionate about football and there's a very uh, passionate debate about who is the best footballer, whether it's Messi or Ronaldo. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in football, but I can say that I'm. I know some things about mathematics, and we can. One way to try to answer this question is to use a metric, which means some sort of measurement. So there's a famous award, a uh, prestigious award in football called the Ballon d'Or, or some sort of balloon maybe. Anyway, uh, Messi has six of these balloons, and uh, Ronaldo only has five. So if you use this metric to decide who is the best footballer, then Messi would be considered the best. And it, likewise, we're going to use different metrics to try to assess the quality of a line in terms of how well it fits the data. We'll be focusing on two metrics, the SSE and the R squared. <coughs> so first, let's look at the SSE. The SSE refers to the sum of the squared errors. So what this means is you take the observed value in the data minus the predicted value from the model, you square it, and then you add up all of these squares. That's why it's called the sum of squared errors. Uh, sometimes people refer to this as the sum of squares of residuals or the residual sum of squares, and they might have different notation for this, the sum, the SSE, but it's the same thing, just as Shakespeare noted that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It's still a rose. The name is different, but what it is, is the same. So remember that the error is also sometimes referred to as the residual, so these two terms basically mean the same thing. All right, so let me illustrate how to compute this SSE, the sum of squared errors. So let's say these are the three data points, and we're considering the candidate line y equals to x. So if you want to calculate the error for the point, the observed value 4, 9, this, the difference between the, the actual value and the predicted value is 5. So you'd have to compute 5 squared. And you need to do the same thing for the other two points. And you can calculate that the sum of squared errors is 41 in this case. So there's a method called ordinary least squares, which is one linear regression method. And this method chooses the line that minimizes the sum of squared errors. Uh, so going back to our data set of the noisy risk scores, the noisy quiz scores. Uh, here are four candidate best fit lines. Right? So is it obvious which line is best? Not really, I think. But we can use we can calculate the sum of squared errors for each of these lines. And what you find is that the purple line has the smallest sum of squared errors. And therefore, it is the, the, the method that would be chosen by ordinary least squares. This is actually the output of a linear regression, so it's not possible to find a, another line with a smaller sum of squared errors. Unfortunately, the sum of squared errors is a metric that's hard to interpret for two reasons. The first reason is that it scales with the number of data points. So if you double the amount of data, you'll get uh, SSE that's roughly twice as big 
And the second reason is that the units are hard to understand because the units are basically the square of the dependent variable, these units. So it's similar to how when you have a random variable, you can compute the variance, but again, the units of the variance are the square of the units of the random variable. So people prefer to work with the standard deviation, which is in the same units as the original random variable. All right, the next metric is the coefficients of determination. It doesn't mean you know how determined you are to get A plus in the class or something. It, it's really about how much of the uh, variance in the response variable can be explained by the linear model. So informally, basic, it captures the value that the linear model adds to the baseline model. Uh, and this is the formula for R squared. It's 1 minus the sum of squared errors divided by the total sum of squares, which is basically the sum of squared errors of the baseline model. Basically, the R squared measures how well a line fits the data points. So for the figure on the left, the R squared will be quite high because the line fits the data points pretty well. But for the figure on the right, the R square will be fairly low because there's a lot of uh, the dots are pretty far away from the line. So what's the baseline model? The baseline model is basically the average observed value of the response variable. So in this case, it would be the average quiz score. So if you had to just predict a number without any information, you just predict the average because that's you know the most obvious simple guess. So the total sum, uh, here's a graph that I borrowed from Wikipedia <laughs> uh, to illustrate the total sum of squares and the sum of squared errors. So this is the baseline model. You take the error, then you, you, know, you square it, so that's why there's a square, and you sum up the areas of these four squares. And this is the sum of squared errors for this line where you take the uh, the difference between the observed values and the po and the predicted values, you take the squares and you calculate the area. So in this example, this SSE is pretty small, it's close to zero, and this SSE is quite large. So basically, if you plug it into the formula, you get an R-square very close to one. So if you think about what values can the R-square take, you'll find that the R-square is always between zero and one. So first, the SSE and SST are sum of squares, and a square number is always bigger than equal to zero. Secondly, uh, the baseline model is also a linear model, so the best linear model should be at least as good as the baseline model. So this means the sum of square errors is always smaller than the total sum of squares. And mathematically, you can work that out to telling you that the sum of squared errors is all the R squared is always between zero and one. And basically, the the better the line fits the data, the closer the, the higher the R squared and the closer it is to one. And if it's a worse fit, the R squared gets lower and closer to zero. So you might wonder: Does a higher R squared indicate that the model is better? One problem with the the R squared is that as you add, if you add any explanatory variable, you would always get a higher R squared, even if the explanatory variable is totally unrelated to what you're predicting. And the reason is basically when you have more explanatory variables, you're providing a model with more degrees of freedom to fit the data. But as you can expect, when you add unrelated explanatory variables, this does not result in better predictions, but instead results in something called overfitting. So what is overfitting? So this graph, again, which I borrowed from a different person on Wikipedia, shows uh, uh, two lines fit to the data points. There's a black straight line, and there's a blue curved line. The blue curved line fits the observed data points exactly, However, argh, how annoying, I need to turn off my WhatsApp, sorry. However, uh, the 
so, so the blue curve line fits the black data points exactly, but uh, we don't expect this blue line to fit to make to be useful in terms of making reliable predictions. So for example, over here it will predict a value of like 15, but over here it will predict just a little bit more on x, it predicts a value of like minus 15. So the predictions vary very wide wildly, even for small changes in x. Whereas the line kind of the black line is kind of steady in terms of the predictions that it makes, and only small changes in x result in only small changes in y. So probably I expect the black line to be a better, uh, a better model of how the data cha y changes in terms of x. So now, because of this, people introduce something called the adjusted r squared, and basically, when the adjusted uh, R squared solves that problem where the multiple R squared always increases when you add a new explanatory variable. But the adjusted R squared increases only if there's a significant increase in R squared, more than you would expect to see by chance. And there's a formula for the adjusted R squared which you don't have to memorize, but you know it's just here shown here for completeness. And basically, when you uh, how you might use the adjusted R squared in practice is if you add a new explanatory variable and you find that adjusted R squared increases and the explanatory variable was significant, then probably the variable is useful. But if it decreases, probably the variable was not useful. All right, so I'm now going to look talk about the factors and dummy variables. So um, remember that factors are used in R to model discrete variables. A discrete variable can take basically only a finite set of possible values compared to continuous variables, which can take values, you know, positive or negative values, or neg values from zero to infinity. So for example, race on MBA place position, there are only a few possible values that this discrete variable can take. So when you estimate a linear model and some of the independent variables are factors, how R handles this is by using something called dummy and coding. So for example, let's say the race variable has three possible levels, white, black, or Asian. So one of the levels will be chosen as the reference level and, the other, and will create a dummy variable for every other possible level. So for example here, uh, the original data might have this race column, which is a factor. So we'll transform the data into uh, this race column into two new columns. Race is black and race is Asian. Um, and race is white is basically kind of the default. If you don't, if the person is white, then you just put zero for these two co new columns. And you can use one in the correct column and zero in the other columns to indicate the correct race for that observation. And when the uh, and when the LM function handles the factors, basically what you'll see is that it will show the uh, so following. Okay, so so basically the this is an example you'll see in the next lecture where there are three colors and blue, green, and red. And blue will be chosen as the reference level, basically because it's first. So what you'll see in the output is you'll see the numbers relative to the blue. So in this case, this coefficient is minus 2.1, which means that the people who like whose favorite color is green, you kind of expect them to score 2.1 points less than people whose favorite color is blue. So although these estimates are not statistically significant, that's what the coefficients, that's how we would interpret the coefficients. And if you try to compare green and red, then you need to be a bit more careful. Basically, green people seem to score one point, about 0.4 points less than people whose favorite color is red. So that's the difference between these two values. And this will become a bit more clear when I go through 
uh, the examples in the next lecture. So all right, so the key takeaways from this lecture are that the sum of square errors and the coefficient of determination, the r squared, help us to measure the fit of a line to the observed data points. The ordinary least squares method chooses basically the line with the, the best fits defined as the smallest SSE or the largest r squared. I mentioned the difference between the multiple versus the adjusted r squared. This one always increases when you add new variables, but this one only increases when you add the good variables. And finally, I mentioned how uh, the linear regression in R handles factors using dummy encoding. Uh, this will become more clear when you see the next lecture. Okay, that's all for now. Bye.